Jesus, you are holy. Yahweh, you are holy. Yes, you are a Messiah, you are holy. To the holies of holies, I enter into the blood of the Lamb. I enter into the holies of holies. I enter through the blood of the Lamb. I access into the holy.
Can we open our mouths this afternoon and begin to honor the King of Glory? Just open your mouth by yourselves and worship Him, exalt Him, honor Him, bow before His throne. The King Majestic, the God of all flesh, the Buddha forth of power, the I am that I am, the one that decrees the end of the theme from the beginning, the King, the King of the universe, the governor of the nations, the one who is good, the end at the beginning, the Alpha, Omega, the King, the God of all flesh, the one in whom there is no shadow of turning, our God majestic, we honor your name. We worship you, Jesus. Kabi is the man of war. Zikanda libra doko sondo lege lega libra da handali magadade. Zekete libra to shanda libra handali kete. Zekakata libra da to somba limaguka. Aga lege lege dege de. Gaso koto yubra katuma. Eje deliga la 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 lu brada kasege lege de ba kusandile mahanda lige lele. Zanta libra katu sanda libra gadeke teke yeke teka yagaga yaga la maduka sem la brago sanda yima gada dudu hotoba la braka shende lege de 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 ba handa luma gida gada handa lika si kala braka shende lima gada do Jesus kalima ke tele bra handa lima gatu tu yarabado la braka sande yemere de de katu la mihi la 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 bradu te jaka tala brade ka sende lima gada do galibra Father, we worship your name. Gracious King, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for life. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with our brethren in your, in your presence. Father, we return the praise to you. Father, Lord, we are already grateful that you, you brought us here. Lord, and we are even more expectant because we know you never convene for nothing. Lord, we ask, oh God, that as your word will go forth. Father, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts in the name of Jesus. Father, that you will equip us for what is our head. In the name of Jesus, we ask that all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration come to you and to you alone. Father, Lord, we honor you. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and please be seated. Um, we have a few guests in the house. We say welcome to you. God bless you for joining us for worship today. We've been in the series called The Journey, and this is the eighth installment of that series. A series called The Journey, and this is the eighth installment. When we started, we did an overview of the fact that every man, every woman, as long as you are in Christ, he's enlisted you and conscripted you into a journey. A journey that you take off from wherever point you gave your life to Jesus. And the ultimate um, destination is that you would arrive in him in the place of eternity. We said that why the journey, there everyone is on a journey, the journey looks different from one person to the other. Hallelujah. We said that the journey looks different from one person to the other. The specifics of the journey looks different from one person to the other. 
and we try to expand. We said the beginning is not a problem because when you have eventually or finally come to Christ, you know you have found a good a good thing. So it's exciting to begin the journey with God. We say knowing that there is an end in sight that God is ordained is also exciting because you know he's preparing you and he's taking you somewhere. So this is not a trip you are making without an end in sight. But we also said that the in-between, that is between the point of when you said, uh, this is the journey I'm embarking on, and when you arrive at the place, that in-between time, well, however the dash would look like for you, is the hardest part of the journey. When you see, um, um, when you go to maybe a, a cemetery and you see, they will say, uh, the hair lies Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so from 19 whatever, whatever, dash, no, 19, whatever, whatever. That dash is the hardest part of the journey with God. Because you can never tell what you will see. The good, the bad, the ugly, the highs and the lows. What thing we are clear about is that he's going with us. So the second thing we said, we said when we, uh, in, in the course of this series is that there is a promise that God gives to everyone that he conscripts or enlists into this journey. He'll give you a word, a promise. And so that when as you begin the journey with him, when you hit a brick wall or it seems like you hit a brick wall, you can always go back to the promise. The idea is what he said to you, you never try to, you make sure you don't forget because it will be your sustaining power throughout the trip. The third installment we talked about the route. We talked about how when the children of Israel left Egypt, God took them. He knew. The Bible said that even though it would have taken about 11 days to go through the land of the Philistines to arrive in the promised land, God took them in the route of the wilderness. And that ended up taking 40 years. And was said that even though God knew a shortcut was available, he took them through what we call the scenic route. He took them through the highs and the lows. He took them through um, experiences where he was a cloud of fire at night and a cloud, um, a, pillar, um, a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. Every time the people went with him, he took them through something. He was building character. He was refining. He was en em 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 empowering them and building capacity for them. Because by the time they will arrive in the promised land, there would be nothing that he would do for them. From the, the moment they stepped into the promised land, he becomes their God and that's what he wants. But everything that they will walk into and they will enjoy in him, they will have to partner with him to do. So he took them through the scenic route and for 40 years, he kept building capacity in them so that when he, the, the, when manna ceased, when quails will no longer come and it was time to till the land, they were ready. When they had the promised land was open to them and they stepped across the Jordan into the promised land, they now were ready. They had been trained to recognize that they had to fight to take the land, even though God had promised and he had given it to them. The fourth installment, we saw that even in all of this, God does not let us go alone. So he gave us a guide in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we said that the trick or the key is to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit says to us. If we pay attention to what the Holy Spirit says to us, we will make a success of our journey. After that, the fifth installment, we talked about the language. We said that we are not like everybody. How we speak matters. Our verbiage is extremely important. The words that we use, they are very important. They are powerful. The Bible says that they are their spirit and their life. And so when you are on a journey with God, you don't speak anyhow. It's actually best for you to keep quiet than to say something that now begins to work against you because everything you say is, has a life of its own. Hallelujah. The sixth installment, we looked at the wardrobe. That everyone who goes on a journey must make sure that they pack feet for the terrain that they are going to. So you can't be traveling in winter from Nigeria. You're going to a land where there's winter and you take all these your flimsy outfits that we wear here in this season. What would happen is that you are most likely going to freeze to death or you're going to have to pay extremely expensive or buy extremely ex expensive winter gear when you arrive at your destination. So how you pack the wardrobe, your wardrobe would determine how enjoyable your ride or your journey will be. Last week, we talked about travel companions, that God 
created us, put man. The Bible says he put the solitary in families. And that who you travel with determines. We talked about how, or we gave the example of how if you were in a, on a plane going somewhere and you sat beside this garrulous, noisy person, you will hate yourself on that trip because it will be the most unenjoyable trip. You want to treat, sleep in his stocking. Or maybe you have this family behind you who have little children and maybe air pops into the child's ear and the child begins to scream. I've been on a plane where you can hear a child screaming for all of four hours. The, whoever is seated beside them has, as we say in Nigeria, bought market. That will be really uncomfortable. So who you travel with matters. And God ensures that we pick our travel companion properly. Today we are going on and today we want to look at the rest stop. The rest stop. Every journey, once in a while, you have to stop and take a breather. Sometimes you stop so that you can repack. Sometimes you stop so that you change your outfit. Because what you had been wearing, you did, um, the next place or the new terrain you are in, your outfit when you left does not quite um, fit. Or yes, the feet where you are now at. So you have to make sure that you change your gear. So we talked about rest stop. Uh, the place where you go to, to rest. I'm not much of a, a sports enthusiast. But my husband Mark is. And... Um, one of the sports that he likes is car racing. He's an avid fan or um, enthusiast of Formula One. And so they've won one very um, exciting thing for him and his children to do is that they would move the furniture in the living room to one corner and they would set up this elaborate car race, uh, race track that he has spent too much money to buy in my opinion. And then they will sit down there for hours and they will be racing and you hear them giggling, you hear them shouting, you hear them say, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm from Langpese. Any car you buy, you must be able to take you from somewhere to another place. You don't buy toy cars. Who buys toy cars? and spends that amount of money to and then when they are done they leave the tracks there even when they pack them they don't quite pack them properly i have to come and pick every pin because i know that if one pin is missing that track won't be able to be set, they won't be able to set it up the next time so i don't remember what we we're talking about one day and he decided to give me a lecture on the pit stop the pit stop in Formula One is the place where after midway or mid-race, they stop so that they can take care of the car and sometimes the driver. And so they come and you see in a flash, there are four people, the four tires have come up, off, they've replaced the tire. You see people wheeling under the car, the car is suspended for a minute and all of this is done in record time. Just so that the car is fit to continue the race that it is on. I found out in the Bible that God puts us, pulls us out sometimes mid-race so that he can bring us to a pit stop. So that our tires can be fixed. So that our, maybe there is an oil leak, something is, uh, something needs to, be, um, the car needs attention and it is done. Sometimes, and these are very rare occasions, they actually pull the car into the pit stop because the driver has fouled something and for disciplinary action, they want to move him out and put another driver. Rare, but it happens. And in those days, I think I, I, I had to read up on it and then Mark confirmed it again to me this morning, that before 2010, part of what they would do at the pit stop is they would refuel the car. But these days, they've now changed the, what the tanks are made of so that the tank can no longer explode. And that means they don't need refueling and so many things. So lives are preserved in the process. The point is that when you are on a journey with God, sometimes when you get meat race, you find that your tire is wobbly. You find that you are running low of, on fear. You find that you need someone else to speak to you. Because something Mark told me this morning. Because before he left for church, I had to say to him, tell me about the peace stop again. And something he said this morning that was interesting was that when the driver pulls into the pit stop, the driver doesn't try to find out what needs to be fixed. There is someone standing right in front of the car and he's looking at everything that is being, is being done. So when it is done, he is the one that will signal to the driver. He will give the driver a signal to say you are A-OK -okay to go. 
And so sometimes God will pull us into a pit stop because there's someone whose counsel we require to receive so that we'll be rejuvenated, revived, restored, or whatever it is we need, and we will continue to go. Hallelujah. Amen. So whether you like it or not, on this journey, there are days you will be weary. You're not weary because you have arrived. You're not even weary because God is giving up on you. You're just weary because when people are in a race, after a while, they lose steam. And God has made um, provision for those places, what I call rest stops, where you can just, he will say, come aside to me. And then you will come aside to him and whatever needs to be taken care of is quickly taken care of so that you can continue the race again. When I was preparing this morning, what I realized was that God is extremely invested in my making it to the, to the, to the destination. Everything that, according to the book of 1 Peter, everything that pertains to life and godliness, he's made available so that even on this journey with him, I, ca I cannot sit, stand here and tell him and tell you or determine when my tire would wear out. But he knows when the tire is about to wear out. And rather than allow me to continue to drive with tires that may um, explode and then cause an accident, he will pull me to the pit stop. But something else I've realized is that most of us don't like pit stops. We don't like pit stops. Because somehow in the body of Christ, we've been made to recognize or to think that pit stops are for weak people. They're like, what are you doing pulling over? You need to continue to go. Oh, everybody is ahead of you now. Meanwhile, the race is not a competition. Everyone is on their track. Everyone will arrive where God is ordained for them to arrive. So when you need a pit stop, you ought to stop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a pit stop or a rest stop at designated points in our journey with God where he pulls us over to come to himself, to go to people so that iron can sharpen iron, to gather with other believers so that we who are in the business of feeding, feeding others will be fed, whatever it takes so that we don't crash out and burn on the journey that we are on with him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24 and to 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. It says, you have all, I'm reading from the message translation. It says, you have all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs. One wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and, and fades. You are after one that is, that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I have got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying a lot and in top condition. I am not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. The point it, I want to establish for you is that we are, on a, we are in a race. Hallelujah. In Isaiah 40, verse number 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31. Isaiah 40, verse 31. I'll read this in the King James translation, Isaiah 40, 31. It says, um, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. <clears throat> and they shall walk and not faint. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. Which, again, buttresses what I've been trying to say. That the strength of man on this journey sometimes would dip. The energy you started with, the burst of zeal, the enthusiasm, the determination, the focus, the commitment. Life can happen to the extent that you begin to feel like, oh my God, this is just a drag. Maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. 2 Timothy 4 verse 7 from the King James. This was Paul, speak, um, Paul speaking to Timothy. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. 
I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at, the, at that day, and not to me only, but unto the, all them also that love his appearing. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> Paul, this was towards the end of his life. And he was saying, I have done well. I know there is a crown waiting for me. I finished my course. Every one of us needs to pay attention and need to, needs to have a plan as to when one day we will be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have run a good race. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. But if we are people who do not stop at the rest stops so that we can receive the replenishment that God will bring us to, the Odds are we may not be able to say so. The point is that the journey we are called to by to, God called so by God is powerful. It requires focus, patience, wisdom, difference, relationship, adequate wardrobe, a mastery of language, training, and such like. Preparation and rest are also critical for enhanced trips and effective arrivals. Every one of us on this journey must have a pit stop. For our journey. Otherwise, arriving may not happen. Think about it with me for a bit. Just as the Formula One cars stop to be refueled, the Bible talks about a renewal of strength, like I read to us in Prover in Isaiah 40. This is akin to refuel refueling. Now, where do you go for your rest stops? That's a question you need to answer. You need to think about it because we don't think about these things. Where do you go for your rest stops? In Hebrews 10, 25, the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of the brethren together. Yes? And in Proverbs 27, 17, I think it says that iron sharpens iron. The point is, if you gather with brethren, as if that is one of your rest stops, if you gather with brethren, then iron will sharpen iron. There must be a brother who makes you better. There would be a sister who makes you better. If you do not forsake the assembly of the brethren together, even when the brethren is not all nice every time, there is always someone there that the Lord enables and empowers to pour into you so that you don't run on empty. The reality is that a lot of believers are running on fumes right now. I can't begin to tell you the number of calls I begin to receive from September of people who are battling depression, who started the race with every vibrance, all the vibrancy that they could find. But somehow as the months continue to turn and expectations begin to look like they are not met, the, 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 the faith begins to wane, the excitement begins to dull. And before you know what is happening, someone is calling you and saying, I'm asking myself, do I have anything to offer? And then you begin to see darkness looking like it's going to swallow them up. Hallelujah. Our rest stops provide us support. They provide encouragement and care. To be aware that one isn't alone on the journey can actually, and can actually turn aside for rest, replenishment is a blessing. Just for you to know that on this journey, you are not alone. God has ordered it in such a way that there is no time in your life that there won't be someone to turn to, that there won't be a place to turn to so that you can receive rest and replenishment should be a blessing to us. It should be such great assurance to know that I'm not alone. God is on my side, yes. But he's also provided physical rest spots for me. So that when I get there, he'll be able to deal with my issues. He'll be able to resolve the things that would hinder my capacity to move forward in the speed that I need to. In Psalm 68, I believe it's verse number 6, it says that the God puts the solitary in families. And that's not a suggestion. And that's not just biological families. God, the way God is ordained, it, he's a community God. He likes community. Even God himself is three in one. And that's because there was a point at some point what God himself wouldn't actually, it wouldn't be proper for him to do. Jesus had to come do. And at some point there were things that Jesus, it wouldn't be proper for him to do. He stepped aside so the Holy Spirit can do. So three in one God, they work in that synergy. 
One is always leaning on the other, even though they are one. How can we then, who are just mere mortars, think that we don't need rest stops? How? How? We cannot do it alone. Rest is critical. If I wanted to drag this, I'll take you to Genesis chapter 2. When the Bible says, and God sees from all of his work. And I'll begin to tell you that the first thing that God modeled to man, for man, the created man to see, was that God gave man the example of how to rest. Even before he walked, he gave man the example of rest. So that man would walk into work in the state of rest. Because unless you walk from rest, you can't deliver on this journey that we are on. Hallelujah. But like I said, I don't want to drag it out, so I'm not going to take you there. The journey of life, brethren, can be wearisome. It can be wearisome. And the thing is, these things don't send a test message. They don't make an appointment. They show up and you begin to wonder, what exactly did I do? How is it that I'm taking all of these knocks in this quick succession? When you find yourself there, begin to ask God to bring you to rest. In 1 Kings chapter 19, from verse 4 to 14, I saw something. I saw the account of Elijah the prophet. And Elijah the prophet had just finished, you know, a, what we call the battle of Mount Mount Carmel, yes, where he came and he wrestled effectively 450 prophets of Baal. He challenged them to dwell their God against their gods against his God. And in that time, the Elijah did so much. And before we knew what was happening, Elijah was calling fire from heaven onto a, an altar that was filled with water, that had animal uh, sacrifice on it, but was doused in water. And yet Elijah was able to call fire down and the fire consumed that really wet offering. Just to prove that Elijah's God was the God. And then Elijah turned to the people and said to them, make sure these 450 prophets do not escape. They were all brought to Elijah and he slew them. If you were watching from a distance, Elijah was boss prophet at that time. He was this massive prophet who could call fire down from heaven. He was this massive pro prophet who could challenge 450 prophets of Baal to dwell. He was this this man who for three years prior has said there shall be no rain and there was no rain. He said at my word there will be no rain. Elijah had arrived. If all of us had to attend the school of prophets today, we were enrolled in Elijah's school of prophets. But let's go to verse number 4 of First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19 verse number 4. First Kings 19 verse number 4. It says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto the Mount Horeb. I want to focus on these four verses. But before I focus on them, let me read them to you in the message translation. In the message translation, I'm compelled to begin from verse 3. It says, when Elijah saw how things were, how, when Elijah saw how things were, he ran for dear life to, to Bathsheba. Far in the south of Judah, he left his young servant there and went on into the desert another day's journey. He came to a lone broom bush and collapsed in its shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all, to just die. Enough of this, God, take my life. I'm ready to join my ancestors in the grave. Exhausted, he fell asleep under the lone broom bush. Suddenly, 
An angel shook him awake and said, get up and eat. He looked around and to his surprise, right by his head, where a loaf of bread baked on some coals and a jug of water. He ate the meal and went back to sleep. The angel of God came back, shook him again and said, to, and said get up and eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. He got up, ate and drank his field and set out. Nourished by that meal, he walked 40 days and nights all the way to the mountain of God to Horeb. Hallelujah. I saw as I read that this Elijah that had done all of these things and everybody was healing him. Almighty prophet, oh man of God, the one that can take 450 prophets down in one day. You know, when I grow up, I want to be like you. All of that healing that we were looking at, Elijah were healing him. Elijah was already on the verge of depression. He was exhausted. He was tired. He was wearied. On top of that, Je um, Jezebel had asked for his head. So Elijah left everyone and went on the run. The thing that I have realized on this journey, and you know, God had to teach me before I hit it, is there are some days that no one, no one, absolutely no one can be there for you even if they wanted to. And so in those times you find yourself alone. And if you are not careful, that's the time you begin to say, God, take me, I'm done. Because you look around you and everything that used to bustle around you isn't bustling anymore. And yet you are still on this journey. God has not told you you are done. But you can begin to tell yourself, I think I'm done now. I can't do this anymore. So it doesn't matter how superpower you are right now. You may say, oh no, I don't need this particular installment of this journey. I don't jump this one past. The reality is you can't make that boast yet. Because the day is going to come. And I think that the big thing, reason why we need to always get to the pit stop or the rest stop is because we must prove our dependence on the God of heaven. So Elijah, who was being healed, went by himself into the south of Judah. He left his servant. He couldn't even take his servant with him. He went by himself. He saw this lone broom tree, uh, um, 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 broom tree they said, and he just collapsed under it. That's how the message version says it. He says he came to a lone broom bush, juniper as the King James version will call it, and collapsed under its shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all. In the King James, he said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. How does a man who five minutes ago did this, how is he reduced to this? How? So again, for a man who just took on 450 prophets of Baal, called down fire from heaven, and on an altar soaked in water and got the people to capture 450 of the 450 prophets and had them slain. He went, he looked like in the twinkle of an eye from boss prophet to wimp of a man. While people were taking newspaper advert space to celebrate Elijah and his exploits, he was burnt out. He was tired. He was angry. He was feeling disappointed. And if he had the guts, he would have killed himself. Even more interesting in the account of Kong's Kingdom chapter 19 for me is that Elijah in this state of screaming to God, just take my life. I'm done. I don't try God. I never try. God took a look at Elijah and all that God said was arise and eat. God did not say to Elijah, you have failed. God did not say to Elijah, why are you tripping? God did not say to Elijah, you are a disgrace to, to prophets. God sent an angel to tap him. And all God said to him was, arise and eat. You know, I always thought that it was arise, kill and eat. That's what I always thought. But I realized that Elijah could not kill at this time. So it was killed, it was prepared, it was brought to him. All that he was meant to do. God did not say to him, tell me what's wrong yet. God just said to him, guy, eat. He ate and he fell asleep. They went and they brought another round of food. They tapped him again. They said, guy, wake up, eat. Your journey, you haven't finished. The journey ahead of you is still far. Rise, eat. 
Elijah ate. He still was saying, God, take my life now. This is just not good. I'm a disgrace. How could I? By then he realized that he ran away from Jezebel. And all God said to him is, eat all. Just eat. Just eat. It's okay. Just eat. There was no, re um, there was no reprimand. There was replenishment. Because God realized quickly that there are physical things that can happen around us that can impact upon our spirituality. And God was not going to preach a sermon to Elijah this time. He knew that what Elijah needed was for his wounds to be bound. He knew that what Elijah needed was for his head to be anointed again. He knew without a shadow of doubt that what Elijah needed was for someone to say, Elijah, I know you are broken, but I see you. I still believe in you. I still know that there is a journey ahead of you. So Elijah rose the second time. He ate. And the Bible said after that, they said to him, or they said to him, eat because the journey ahead of you is, is far. And when he had finished it, and the Bible said, in the strength of that meal, he went 40 days and 40 nights. If you had read that account further, you will find out that it's after all of this that God said to Elijah, you know what's going to happen. Now you have to go and anoint three people. And anoint Hazael as king of Syria or Aram. Anoint Jehu as king of Israel. Anoint Elisha as prophet in your stead. But I'll come to that because it's not time yet. This alone is enough to establish the need for a rest stop. God brought Elijah to one. Right after this, Elisha became Elisha, Elijah's servant. And I saw in Elijah's own ministry that Elisha did never allowed himself to get to the place of burnout before he turned in. Because in 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 8 to 11, we saw that Elisha was going somewhere. The Bible said he had to go past Shunem. And as he was going past Shunem, there was this woman. The Bible called her, in the King James translation, he called her a great lady. In the, um, in the message, he called her a leading lady. This leading lady of, Shum, of Shunem saw Elisha and said to her husband, I know for certainty that this is a holy prophet. In the King James, she said, I perceive that this is a man of God. And she said to her husband, let's build for him a chamber at the top of the house so that every time he makes a trip here, he can turn in. And inside that ch chamber, they've put four things. They put a, ta a bed, they put a table, they put a lamp, and they put a stool or a chair. And then she approached Elijah and she said, Man of God, we've prepared a place for you. We know your life can be hectic and tedious. So once in a while, as whenever you're going here, just know that that place is your permanent guest house or guest room. You can turn in any time. You don't need to tell us you're coming. As long as you show up, we will give you access to that room. We just want you to be replenished and strong enough so that you can finish your journey. And from that point on, Elisha, every time Elisha was on his way to Camel, Elisha would stop and he would turn in. Every time Elisha was on the journey past that place, he would stop and he would turn in. And so what I thought had happened there was Elijah did not know best practice about rest stops. But because he went through it and he mentored Elijah or discipled Elisha ultimately, he was able to teach Elisha the importance of rest stops. And all that was required now was to find a designated place for Elisha to come. So God spoke to a woman on the path that Elisha would travel. And that woman made the effort and they made the provision. So Elisha didn't need to worry when he was tired. Elisha didn't need to worry when he was afraid. Elisha didn't need to worry when he was hungry. And Elisha, Elisha didn't need to worry when he felt sick. He had a safe place up in the chamber where he could turn in. That became his regular rest stop on this journey every single time he traveled. Brethren, your rest stop is a designate place where you go for refueling, for repair, 
for replenishment, whatever it is that it is for you. There must be a place where when you go, it doesn't matter how parched you are. It will feel like water poured on you. There must be a place that God will open your eyes to step into. There must be a relationship or a band of relationships that God will bring your way so that you are never dry and broken on this journey. It doesn't matter whether you are 80 today, there's still way ahead. Because until you take the last breath, we never know there's still way ahead. If you have a great journey in front of you, how are you feeding? Some of us have, COVID has made us people who eat crumbs from one table to another table to another table to another table. We in one Sunday, we listened to 20 sermons. The problem is no one was landed in our spirit. Because we have this, we're just itchy. Ten minutes of this, so oh, I've heard, I've received my word. That's how we say Christianity will not kill us. I've received my word. You jump to the next one. And you jump to the next one. So by the end of that day, you have disjointed. If it was in those days, they will say you probably would have kwashoko because you, the, the diet is not balanced. You did not finish any train of thought. So God could not land anything he was saying to you. But I digress. So Elisha, the woman said, I'm certain this is a holy man. Let us create a small room, a rest stop upstairs for him. Let us furnish it with a bed. Let us furnish it with a table. Let us furnish it with a lamp. And let us put a stool there for him. So that every time he goes through this part, he can turn in there and rest. So they put a bed there. The bread is symbolic of rest. Every single one of us needs a day when we rest. Now, if you have worked with God enough or you are on this journey and you are paying attention, you will know that rest is not necessarily inactivity. It is a state of your spirit to know that no matter what, God is in charge. So they put a bed there. No matter what happened to Elisha, Elisha was clear that God was on his side. I mean, think about it. If God was not on his side, how will he touch this woman who she didn't even know, he didn't even know existed to build him a place so that he would have somewhere to turn in? But because we are constantly trying to prove something, rest is not something we take seriously. Because rest requires that in a season you need to drop what is your responsibility that you know in that season. Just step back and let God reopen your eyes and take another look at you. A submission to healing from the wounds that you are bound to incur on this journey. A lot of us don't recognize that because we are not warring against flesh and blood, even when nobody is attacking you, because I know we are very adept in the, uh, in the uh, attack conversation. We, we pride ourselves in the affliction conversation. But the reality is life will happen and no one may be attacking you. No one may be afflicting you, yet you will be broken. And God is saying, I have put a bed somewhere. Find that place and when you get there, just step back. Don't try to save anybody because it's time to save you. Whatever wounds you were inflicted on on the journey, part of the sickness can be unforgiveness. Part of the sickness can be bitterness. It can be anger. And God is saying, enter this process room. Let's deal with those things that are impeding your journey now. Because by the time Elijah, Elijah got to the juniper tree, Elijah was very clear. He was so clear that he was the only prophet that was on the earth at that time. He was so He said, only me. I'm the only one remaining. What can I, one of me do against all these people? Cuckoo kill me. That was what he said. Because when you are wounded, when you are bowed over, your perspective will be tainted. They put a table there. And the table, anywhere in the world, the table is meant for study. We all need to remember that on the journey, regardless of how much we do and how much we know, there is a need to keep growing. Rest stops are places where you come back again so that the Holy Spirit can brood on you for further growth. So he sat at the table. We were not told what he did exactly. 
But he was growing, which was why he, that became a favorite place for him. Rest stops afford us the opportunity to sit at the table, to learn, to study, and receive instruction for what is next. At that table, you will see your preparation track. Because now there's no one um, um, clapping. There's no one applauding. There is, you are there by yourself, you and your God alone. God can now say to you, take another look at what you did two weeks ago. Was that the best way you could have done it? Now there will be another opportunity ahead of you in six months. You need to take the learning now so that when you get there, you will do it properly. Elisha had a table. Rest stops will provide you a place to prepare for what is ahead of you. A place to heal from what is, what is behind you. And a place to prepare for what is ahead of you. The third thing they put there, one um, translation says a lamp, the other one says a candle. What is a candle for? It's for light, it's for illumination. At rest of fresh revelation is available. It, because that's how, when you are doing, the odds are that it becomes really noisy. But when you take time out to, a, to that rest stop, you can mind fresh revelation. New things will be released to you. Or old things will be refreshed and freshened. And you can see and say, yes, this is really good. This is new. This is fresh. Elijah would have continued to go around with the wrong notion, for instance, that he was the only prophet until he went under the juniper. By the time he, the Lord finished with him and he went from there into a cave, guess what Elijah realized? There were 7,000 men who had never bowed their knee to bow. So everything that Elijah, Elijah thought he knew that made him so angry and frustrated was a lie from the pit of hell. But until he got into the cave, he could never have found out out. Some of us are grappling with where we are right now. And all it takes is a turning aside to God. So that he will with fresh, give us fresh eyes. To see afresh. So that we can see that all we thought was. Because we can, we can read meanings to stuff. All that we think it is, is not is. What we think it is, is not what it is. So he's saying, step aside. I have light here. I have illumination here. I want to show you great and mighty things that you have not known. Just turn into me. Call on to me and I will show it to you. I want to open your eyes to revelation that you would use for a very long time. That will save you from the pain and the aggro you are in now. But you first need to turn and stop for a while. It was in that place that he knew that he was going to, you know, God gave him the opportunity at that rest stop in that cave. This is Elijah. God gave him the opportunity of succession planning. Take a look at your Bible very well and tell me how many other prophets had this opportunity. None. That God will say, do this. And do this. All the basics. Because Elijah was that prophet that did the work. He judged Syria from where he was. He judged Israel as a prophet. And he acted as a prophet still. And God said to him, now here's what we're going to do. The work and the grace that you carried, no one man can carry it going forward. I'm going to split it into three people. But you are the one that must anoint them. On your way out of here, anoint Hazel as king of Syria. On your way out of here, further down, anoint Jehu as king of Israel. And then you will find Elisha, the Tishbite. Make, anoint him as prophet in your stead. When all of that is done, then you can come back to me and say take me because then you will be ready but all of that revelation came because he turned aside the fourth thing that they put in that room is a stool or what today we will call a chair in bible times a stool is a is is is, is, is a contraption that is put together so that when a woman is about to bring forth she can sit on it so the stool is a posture by which we produce. 
When you are broken, when you are hurting, when you are frustrated, when you are angry, when you are tired, when you can't see anymore, when you can't hear God anymore, the odds are your productivity will dip. And if God will bring you to the stool, he will, after you have rested, he will put you on a stool. Because it's not over until it's over. Remember that I said that there is a start point and there's definitely an end point on this journey. And you cannot call the end if God has not called it. So instead, God would replenish you and then put you on the stool again. And as you sit on the stool again, you will find that, that you are able to produce some more. In Elisha's case, he got access to this room or chamber. And the Bible records that every time on his way to Mount Carmel, he would stop and spend time there. Elisha must have learned from Elijah how vital a pit stop is. Rest stops are priceless and they are important. Even Jesus stopped in Gethsemane. At some point, Jesus, the king of kings, was tired. In his flesh, he couldn't go on. The Bible said he said to his disciples, turn aside with me for a while. Let's tarry and pray. Of course, his disciples couldn't even pray because they were even more tired. Jesus went in and he prayed. It's very interesting that he prayed a refined version of the prayer that Elijah, pray, Elijah prayed. He said, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass over me. The refinement is he knew. He said, but... Not my will. Let your will be done. Jesus was tired. Three times he prayed. Because he knew that unless the Lord helped him from that point on. The exact reason why he came on earth. His flesh was saying to him, don't get it done. The question is, if Jesus felt like this, who you be? So Jesus stepped at the garden, he was spent to, something was coming and he didn't feel equipped to handle it. Turning in helped him pray through. And because of that time alone, he was able to follow through on the assignment, the reason why he came in the flesh. Rest stops would come in the format of forsake not the assembly of the brethren together. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. Sometimes a person is your rest stop. Rest stops can look like those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. It can be a situation where you by yourself lock yourself in a room with God. And you're like, Lord, you have to breathe on me again. I have read in your word in Isaiah 40, 31, that you can renew my strength. I lack strength for the next phase of this journey. You need to help me. Rest stops can look like Isaiah 30, verse 15. It says, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Rest stops don't necessarily need to be announced. The person who's taking them just needs to know that this is where I am at this time. It doesn't make me a bad person. I am not weak by any stretch of imagination. It's not sin that brought me here. It's just that it is time to renew. If I will continue. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29, the Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then it talks about the exchange. It says, take upon, me my, uh, upon you my yoke and my burden. Because my yoke is light and my burden is easy. God is calling us daily. At this point in time, he's saying, do not end 2021 at a breakneck speed like you've been going. Take a rest stop. Just come to me. I want to show you what is ahead. I've always said to people that God is not interested in surprising us. Contrary to what we think, that God hides everything. And then he, wa what you, he wants you to know. He said concerning, he said, will I do anything without sharing with my prophet? Or my, yes, my friend Abraham. God wants you to know. But when you are not taking the time out, when you are not stopping, when you are not talking, when you are not listening, when you can't, for the life of me, just say, I know feet. 
How are you going to hear what he has to say? In Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, don't fret or worry. I'm reading the message. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, we come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces your worry at the center of your life. So a rest stop would be exchanging your worry for the stability that can come from God. In Jeremiah chapter 6, Jeremiah 6, verse 16. It says, Thus said the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. God is calling. He's always calling. We almost determine what or where our rest stops look like. We must adapt the right, adopt, uh, adapt the right posture to receive from our rest stops. Rest stops are places and seasons of restoration, replenishment, cultivation, rejuvenation, refocus, and refining. The question for me will be, be me, would you acknowledge that you need a red stop. Because sometimes reputation will not let me acknowledge that I need a rest stop. Posturing will not let me say, I have nothing else to give. So we begin to run in fumes. I don't know whether you've ever suffered an all, a stomach ulcer before. You will know that the rule of those who have had ulcers, who have uh, suffered from ulcers, stomach ulcers, is you must never not have food in your tummy, no matter what. Some of us have spiritual stomach ulcers because it's been long that we took anything that revitalized us in the word of God. It's been long. All we're doing is regurgitating. There's nothing new. When was the last time you heard new revelation? It takes making time. Your rest stop can be this thing that you do with God once a week, once a, every day, whatever. But the thing that I know that I'm trying to say, I don't know if I'm saying it, is that 2022, you can't run on fumes. You cannot run on fumes. Our journey is too important to allow a lack of rest or a rest or a lack of a rest stop affect or color our results or our outcomes. God is banking on us. If you read that Genesis chapter 2, what you will find is that God is no longer in the business of working. God has ceased from all of his work and he's relying on you and me to get it done. If God is relying on you and me to get it done, tell me. Are we equipped? Are we ready? When was the last time you turned into God by himself? Not for show. Not so that men will clap. What was the last thing that God said to you? And it's been three months and you're still just re chewing it and you have not shared with anybody. Because you know this one is not to announce. It is to walk through. When was the last time? In Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 9 to 11. It says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. Aha. If you truly have entered the rest of God, you will be able to answer very adequately the question, what is the content of your hustle? It says, he that had entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, 
to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. If I'll just add verse 12 for good measure. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Brethren, the idea is we are on a journey. And this series, when we started, I did say to us that maybe the earliest we can land it is 12 installments. And this is number eight. But I'm even thinking that it may push to like 16 installments. The idea is you need to know that you did not drop from the sky or your mother just gave back to you. And you're just running around and doing what you want, how you want it. You're placed there by God very intentionally on an assignment. And God, the last thing he wants is for his own to crash and burn. He wants us to arrive. Everything that he has ordained, he's put inside of us by potential. As we allow him to process us on the journey, everything we need for life and godliness, to arrive where he wants us to, he will begin to process them out. And there is a huge chunk of this that will be processed at the place of the pit stop. Are you going to stop? Will you catch your breath? Take a look around you. What can you see? How are you feeling in this moment? Will you tell yourself some hard truths today? Pretends will not work this. Fake it until you make it will not work this. The only thing that happens is when you get to that place, we all need to get to that place where we say, Lord, if you don't help me, I'm done. Elijah said, it is time, just kill me because I have nothing anymore. But God said to him, the journey ahead of you is still far. And God said, rise and eat. Brethren, the table is set. And God is just waiting for us to turn in. All of creation, he says in Romans chapter 8 verse 19. Earnestly awaits the manifestation of the sons of God. There's nothing that is going to change on earth. Whatever piece of the earth you are in. That will not come through the hand of a son of God. They are waiting. They are groaning. They are crying. They are praying. They are saying, Lord, send us someone. And God is saying, look at the sea of men and women. I've sent them already. But they are too busy to turn in for rejuvenation. They are too busy to turn in for replenishment. They are too busy to turn in for fresh revelation. The Lord wants to show you what is coming. The Lord wants to equip you for work. He wants you to take the right posture because there's many more things that he wants you to bring forth. But will you find your pit stop? Will you find your pit stop? Will you find the place where he's prepared the meal that will take you in the strength, in the strength of that meal you can go another 40? Are you ready? For the Lord to turn you aside. Will you be willing to be missing from the action for a bit? Just so that God can pack strength back into you. You are the one who would make that decision. You are the one that needs this moment to begin to talk to God. To say, Lord, I see the error of my way. I'm running too hard. I'm crashing and I'm burning. I choose to turn around now. I choose to turn aside to you. I will wait on you. I will join the gathering of the brethren together. I will become poised to be sharpened by another iron. I would exchange my weight and my body and my, and my, and my yoke with what you have to give to me. I will lie on the bed you have prepared. I will sit at the table and I'll open my spirit so that you can prepare me. Oh yes, Lord. I want to, the lamp to shine again because fresh revelation is needful for this next phase of my journey. And Lord, teach me how to squat properly. I want to bring forth what is in my nest. I do not want to crash and burn. Unless you are done with me, I choose not to be done. I want to rest in you. Hold my hands, O oh God. I turn aside to you. Father Lord, may I see you. 
I am on a journey with you, remember? I may have taken a step out of the way, but Lord, I return. Your word says that it is in rest and in quietness that I will possess. My, I shall be saved. Lord, I return. I return to you this evening. I'm tired of posturing. I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of acting like I've got it when I no longer have it. I come to you, oh God. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And whether you are in this room or you're online and you have not given your life to Jesus, ah, oh, your own journey is even further. There is nothing like turn aside. You have not even turned in the first time. But today is a good day. You should say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. You should say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. This woman says it is possible to find rest in you. I need rest, oh God. Lord, help me. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. The rest of you, if you are burnt out, you know. If you are running on fumes, you know. If you are angry, you know. If you are bitter, you know. If you have, oh, if you have unforgiveness, you know. I know what I have. You know what you have. Speak to him this evening. Say, Lord, help me. Take me by the hand. Because exactly where your are is where I want to go. Help me, O oh God. And let your name be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. We give you all the praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I receive, O oh God, the leading to my rest stop. I receive, O oh God, the leading to my rest stop. I walk in, oh God. I embrace your mercy today. I come back into you. Allah hinda lima handa labrado. To you be all the praise. To you be all the praise. Kayene ma handu labrada duta to. Kesheke tele badu sandali ma dakate. Kayida da badu sandali ma doko sandoli brade. Kashande yemede. I put my hand in your hand. Help me, oh God. Help me, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father Lord, we thank you. Thank you for not judging us. Thank you for not reprimanding us. Thank you for just asking us to come, rise and eat. Lord, we have shown up, oh God. Feel us, oh God, that we might be equipped for the journey ahead. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we honor and we worship you. We give you all the praise, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Father Lord, thank you. We worship you.